Who's excited to be at the ninth annual Street Talk 10 and 1? So the first is that we launched our 64 hours uh, closing the bus equity uh, gap report in September. This was um, a labor of love. Uh, Andrew McFarland and our staff spent months and months and months on this report. Um, and the report calls for many things. But primarily what we say is to close this gap, we need many, many more buses, many more bus facilities, and a new intention um, uh, to focus on better serving our, our low income and communities of color. Just yesterday, the Fiscal Management and Control Board gave the MBTA staff the thumbs up to order an addition, additional 60 buses. <laughs> yes. Yes, and this is so important because there was a deluge of just like critical, horrible news yesterday. And what got lost in that was that there was great stuff happening. This is one of the key first recommendations out of this report, and it happened less than three months after the report came out. We are only getting started. We're going to keep rolling it out, but we should be very excited. And we are likely to see those buses on the ground in the next 18 months, which is very fast. So we're very excited about this win. And just a few weeks ago, um, the Vision Zero Coalition stood with Governor Baker to sign in the hands-free bill. For those of you who don't know, this has been a decades-long fight to get this bill passed. There have been dozens of partners, um, you know, victims, family members, um, hundreds of people who showed up at World Day of Remembrance. And you know, we absolutely could not have done this without the Vision Zero Coalition. Um, but this was only one of our legislative priorities. So also know that we're going to be coming back for much, much more in 2020. And last but not least, yeah. Last but not least, we stood with statewide coalition partners and our Congresswoman Ayanna Presley in Washington, DC to celebrate the launch of the Future of Transportation Caucus. Um, for those of you who missed this, uh, uh, Ayanna, we get to call her Ayanna because she's our friend, right? We knew her before she was cool. Um, I really went to Washington um, with the idea that we needed to fundamentally transform the way that we fund um, transportation at the federal level and really rooted in community experience. So this caucus is designed to educate her peers and, you know, fundamentally transform the federal transportation system. So um, we're only getting started, but it was amazing that um, from the beginning, this caucus was rooted in the community leadership here and that we have an opportunity to continue to influence the federal conversation in the new year. So congratulations to all of you. All right, so it's the, this spirit of collaboration. Every single one of these wins was about having a coalition of partners. It is about the advocates in the room, the individuals in the room, the state and city agencies and elected officials all working together. Um, and all of that collaboration is what inspires this event. So tonight you will hear from 10 different people doing 10 different things. It's only a corner of the advocacy happening in this community, um, but I hope it gets you excited and inspired. Um, and, and without further ado, we're going to start. And I am going to turn it over to our first set of speakers. Um, I'm so excited to introduce you to Tracy Corley from Mass Inc. and uh, Josh Fairchild from uh, Transit Matters. They are going to help sort of take us out of Boston to start and give a little love to our gateway cities who we sometimes ignore. I'm Josh. And, and I'm Tracy. Uh, I was a co-founder of Transit Matters back in 2015 and uh, I'm currently serving as the, the board president. And I'm currently on the board and serving as a co-chair of the development committee. And uh, my day job is not doing fun stuff like this, so I'm really excited to be here tonight. Tracy, though, has an amazing day job. I get to do transit-oriented development, a third of which uh, focuses on transportation, but also get to do economic development and land use development across Massachusetts, particularly in our gateway cities. So if you took a Venn diagram of what our organizations are really excited about right now, what would be directly in the middle would be regional rail. And tonight is sort of half celebration and half dedication um, for regional rail and what we've already accomplished in getting it to be something that's going to happen and what we need to do from here on out. Excellent. So, oh. Yay. Okay. So I'm going to read the, the <laughs> mission of our organization. No, we're not going to do that. Okay. So... Oh. We agreed that I would have the clicker, but it didn't work that way. Okay. 
So we started in 2015 and uh, we really seek as an organization to get really into technical nitty gritty of transit and figure out how to elevate that into the common discourse um, in, in order to really demand the things that are really going to be systematic uh, and, and effective for better transit in the region. So uh, at Mass Inc, it's kind of interesting because at our transformative transit-oriented development strategy focuses in on a 2018 report that we wrote that did an analysis and found that we could actually get 140,000 more people and jobs in our gateway cities. Um, and that's with the existing uh, infrastructure that's there. Uh, and we're expected to have a, an additional 600 to 800,000 more people moving into Massachusetts by 2040. Uh, this is what we call our virtual cycle of benefits that can come out of transit-oriented development. We think that land use and transportation, when taken together with economic development, can address the geographic inequities, uh, disinvestment, economic stagnation or decline that we've seen across our gateway cities, health issues, climate change, and social de deterioration. So we're all about, at least I'm all about TOD. So yeah. So what are gateway cities? For those of you who don't know, it's our 26 legislated cities across the Commonwealth that used to be industrial giants back when Boston was nothing but a backwater. But unfortunately, since World War II, they've kind of declined a little bit. And as a result, you've seen a lot of concentration of job and economic growth in Metro Boston region. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to take these uh, cities that have their own local economies, they, have, uh, they serve as regional hubs for their areas, and we're trying to turn them back into very strong regional locations where people who are living in rural and suburban areas can count on them to provide them with the, their daily needs. And regional rail serves as a backbone of this, providing 15-minute, at least in my opinion, 15-minute, all-day, bi-directional service to our gateway cities as those dense hubs. But the next slide shows you here some of the realities of what's happening in our gateway cities. Even though they comprise roughly a quarter of all of the jobs and population in our commonwealth, they disproportionately have 40% of our state's affordable housing stock, 45% of, of the state's residents who live in poverty, two-thirds of the state's residents who live in high poverty neighborhoods, and 75% of the state's students in underperforming schools. MassInc works on a lot of different policy issues. I focus on transit-oriented development, but we think that we can actually advance all of, the, uh, advance all of these issues uh, through multiple strategies, including TOD. So in 2018, uh, Transit Matters took what was an idea um, that we were just talking about, like how could we make um, what is global best practice regional rail and bring it into effect in Massachusetts in transforming our commuter rail network. And so we, we uh, put out a white paper in winter of 2018. And then earlier this year in the fall, we released our second, which was a, a proof of concept of line by, beginning to go line by line of how we could do this and addressing uh, some, some key areas uh, operationally, how, how we can achieve regional rail. We will continue to go line line by line, by line, by line, by line, until we've got all of them. And, um, you know, we definitionally, regional rail was um, not really in the lexicon here. Um, and I think that one of the things that Transit Matters has been really excited about is to hear people actually using the term regional rail, because we think, obviously, words always mean a lot. Um, and the, one of the problems, though, is sometimes they use it inappropriately. Uh, definitionally, definitionally um, re Transit Matters says regional rail, uh, the, the quick components are system-wide electrification um, for faster frequent service um, and better acceleration. Uh, high platforms, which provide universal access, but also quicker boarding and deboarding. Um, strategic infrastructure investments to relieve bottlenecks. Uh, think of these single track areas. We have to wait 10 minutes for the train to make it through. Uh, frequent all day service. So all day long, you'd have service 15 minutes uh, in the inner parts of the system and, and, and 15 minutes peak everywhere, and then 30 minutes uh, further out, even in the non-peak times. Uh, and then that, that we'd have a fully integrated, a fully integrated system. So, yeah, this is our celebration slide. Uh, the FMCB, the control board, voted to actually do regional rail, recognizing that as a vision for the Commonwealth and our rail system, and also that it will be implemented beginning with phase one, um, which they'll start working on in the next few years and begin reporting on in January. Yeah, and I'm going to really skip over this slide because we only have about a minute and a quarter left. Uh, so, you know, we want to make sure that regional rail is uh, providing access, connectivity, and mobility, and which includes a number of things, but... Uh, Go ahead, Josh. This is highlighting the city. These are all the gateway cities, and the highlights are the ones that will be impacted by phase one of regional rail, and also Worcester and Blue, because we're going to continue to push for near-term improvements on the Worcester line. 
All right, and so on this slide, we're showing that, you know, we think that through stronger ties between Mass Inc. and uh, Transit Matters, we can actually improve economic and environmental justice through electrification, uh, keeping in mind that in the past, our uh, TOD areas have been commuter parking lots, which have generated a lot of uh, very negative effects in terms of uh, social in infrastructure as well as environmental impacts. And we think that for moving forward in the future, that we need to address some of these economic differences, which you can see here on this chart, to make sure that uh, people who are living in our gateway cities are actually uh, participating in our, our economy and think that electrification is a way to get faster, more reliable service that is more environmentally and economically equitable. So keep going. And this kind of shows you just a comparison of uh, people paying, you know, more than their recommended 45% of their household incomes on transportation and housing. And when you add the green, the commuter rail fares, it's unsustainable. Uh, so the new system will provide access to everyone to high quality transit, but will they be able to afford it? That's a big question that we're also going to be pushing very hard on, and the Fiscal Management Control Board has mandated uh, the MBTA to look into. And as we get close to uh, closing here, we know that a lot of people have been talking about uh, free transit, and we think that you know it, it is a strong possibility that if it's feasible, that we, it's able to boost ridership. It also is able to normalize transit use, which is something that the city of Seattle did in its downtown core, as well as uh, we need to start looking at total costs of transit not just fare box recovery, so that we're including the social impacts, the environmental impacts, the public health impacts, which means we're gonna to have to change our goals as to how we think about our transit systems. Most importantly, as we finish here, is to know that, and to think about the fact that um, when, when the train, uh, the regional rail trains come to these gateway cities, they also need a seamless bus experience, not just for transfers, but for all the connections they need to make within the gateway cities. And so when the, the bus transformation office, which is also mandated by the board, needs to expand their scope to be not just focused on Boston and the very close inner suburbs, but also making sure that no matter where you go, you're not having to choose between affording a transit pass or having to have a car. So... I think that's it. Just hashtag MassTOD, please. Thank you very much, and thanks for your support. But now we are going to turn to a topic that is close and dear to my heart, parking. Um, I... <laughs> Right, right. You all know how much I love parking. Um, I this is maybe one of my favorite reports that came out this year, and I'm going to have Kasha from MAPC tell you a little bit more in seven minutes. Hi, everyone. My name is Kasha Hart. I'm with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. I am here today to talk about a multi-year research effort that we undertook called our Perfect Fit Parking Initiative. Let's see how many pieces of technology I can handle at once. All right. So how many of you have recently been to a meeting where the topic of parking or traffic has come up around a new development? I'm seeing a lot of hands. I'm seeing a lot of hands. As we know, there are a lot of different needs and desires when it comes to how much parking we should be building at multifamily developments. But oftentimes, there is not a lot of up-to-date data that is happening in these conversations. So you may think, What's the big deal? Let's just build a couple extra spaces. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. There's actually a lot of consequences associated with overbuilding parking beyond just the financial impact of building those extra spaces. This means that we are allocating resources to, oh, to empty parking spaces and not to much needed housing units for the region. We're adding more impervious surfaces and we are taking up space that could be used for open space or other amenities for residents. If this happens enough at a large enough scale, we end up with development patterns that are more conducive to driving than walking, biking, or taking public transit. And in turn, this makes our communities more congested, expensive, and polluted. Not ideal. So that's why the goal of our Perfect Parking Initiative is really to help guide municipal decision making around modernizing local parking policy in a way that's context specific and data informed. So first, in order to begin our research, we should understand what's the extent of the problem in the region. Specifically, how much parking are we building on multifamily developments, but really how much parking is actually being utilized at these sites. So what do you think the best way to answer this question is? I will tell you from experience, Google is not particularly helpful. The property managers, there's only a handful that really keep track of this information on a, you know, a real-time basis. So we figured the best way was just to go see, see for ourselves. 
myself and 14 of my colleagues, shout out to Sarah Lee in the audience for volunteering to, <laughs> yep, yep. For volunteering, volunteering to go out in the middle of the night and count how many parking spaces were occupied at nearly 200 sites across the region. And just to explain, we did these counts overnight on a weeknight when we assumed most residents were home, asleep, we're measuring how full the lots are during peak residential demand times. So across these 200 sites, we saw an average of exactly one space per unit supplied, but only an average of 0.73 spaces per unit demanded. And if you think about what the parking requirements are in your community, I know a lot of people in the room know what the parking requirements are in their community, probably higher than those numbers. Additionally, across all the parking spaces that we counted, we found a total occupancy rate of 70%. That means three out of 10 spaces that we observed overnight during peak demand times were empty. So I just want to hammer home what the just the financial impact of build overbuilding parking is. Based on the combination of surface and garage spaces that we saw overnight, we're estimating that the average construction cost for any given space that we saw was $16,000. In total, we counted almost 6,000 empty parking spaces, which amounts to nearly $95 million in development costs. I can think of a lot of really great things we could do with $95 million. So now that we have a sense of what the problem is, we wanted to do a deeper dive and better understand what building and neighborhood characteristics influence parking demand. I will say, far and away, parking supply drives demand. You can see on this chart here the very strong correlation between the two variables. And what I think that means is that cities and towns actually have a lot of opportunity to help guide development patterns that are either more or less conducive to driving. Said another way, if you are building ample parking at multifamily sites, you are more likely to attract more car-owning households. With more cars comes more vehicles, more driving, again, more congestion, more pollution. The two other factors that we found to be statistically significant was transit accessibility, as measured by jobs accessible by transit, Specifically, as transit accessibility increases, as people have more options beyond driving to work, parking demand decreases. And then as the percentage of deed-restricted affordable units in a building increases, parking demand decreases. And while the correlation between affordability and transit accessibility and supply and demand and supply and demand is not as strong as supply and demand. We think there are a variety of policy interventions that cities and towns can employ to help us right-size parking. So I will just touch on a couple of those, but we have many more available on our website. We found excess parking in every one of the 14 communities that we surveyed, which indicates that at the very least, we can start thinking about reducing minimum parking requirements. And I think a lot of cases in instituting parking maximums or eliminating requirements altogether could be appropriate. Second of all, building ample parking at TOD sites is counterproductive to the goals of transit-oriented development. If we want people to be able to live near transit so they can readily take that transit, it doesn't make sense to build a lot of parking at those sites. And finally, not only must these TOD sites have a larger share of affordable units, but we also need to be mindful about how we are allocating our scarce affordable housing resources to the provision of parking versus other uses, including more units. So in conclusion, I want to leave you with two things. First, a hopeful vision for what our future can look like if we achieve the perfect fit. And I encourage you all to visit our website, perfectfitparking.mapc.org. You can download our whole report, and you can download all of our data and take that to your next public meeting. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Who here is excited to read Perfect Fit? Yes. Um, it is, I actually, I told Kasha that I literally sent it to a developer who was trying to build something behind my house last week. I was like, I have a report for you. Get rid of that parking. Um, all right. So our next speaker, we're going to shift gears a little bit and do some, some more systems thinking. Um, and I will say the first time that I met Christoph, um, it was on a train from Houston to L.A., 
we um, were spending 36 hours traveling to Nacto together, and I can guarantee that he only thinks about transportation because I spent that much time with him, and we only talked about trains and buses and trains and buses. So when he talked to you about bus network redesign, I can tell you that he has done more thinking about it than anyone in this room and maybe anyone in this country. Uh, welcome, Christoph Spieler. So I'm really happy to be here and, and talking about bus network redesign. So the reason I'm talking about this is I was a transit board member in Houston. Um, I got to be a board member because I wrote a blog, which should be a lesson to all of you, get involved in these things. Um, but I asked a very simple question. What would our bus system look like if we reimagined it from a clean sheet of paper? And as a result of that, Houston completely redesigned its bus network every single route overnight in 2015. And what we were able to do as a result of that is go from a radial network that looked like this to a grid network that looked like this, which means you don't have to go through downtown Houston to get anywhere else. And we were also able to radically improve frequency. This was our old network. Red lines every 15 minutes or better, blue lines every 30 minutes, green lines once an hour. This was in the middle of the day on a weekday. This was on a Saturday. This was on a Sunday. Notice entire neighborhoods with no service. Notice only one frequent route. We were able to do this, and that is seven-day-a-week service. Every bus route running as frequently running as frequently on Sunday as it does midday on a Monday. This is a transformative network, and it really suits what people need. We aren't in a nine-to-five world anymore. Um, and what we got as a result of that was 4% ridership gain on weekdays, 13% ridership gain on Saturdays, 33% ridership gain on Sundays, while the rest of the country was losing transit ridership, we were actually gaining it. And moreover, we provided much better service to the people who were already using transit. Our riders were suffering through a very bad system. We now have a system where three quarters of our riders are boarding the bus at stops that have frequent service. Most of the people who are using Houston's bus network found their trips got faster, found their service got more frequent, found their connections got more direct. We have much better coverage of where people actually live today, and we have much better coverage of low-income neighborhoods. The people who most need the bus, the bus is now there for them a lot better. And as a result of that, we got a lot of coverage. A lot of people said, what you need to do is you need to reimagine your bus network just like Houston did. And they made it sound really easy, which it wasn't, and they made it sound like this magical tool. And there's a good reason for that. If you have taken a bus in the United States, you know that the experience of taking a bus in the United States is generally pretty awful. We are not very good at bus. It is a vital part of our transit system, yet we really don't do it very well. I would say just about every place in the United States needs better bus service. But there's lots of ways to make bus service better that doesn't involve redesigning a network. We could put bus lanes in place. Bus lanes make service faster. They make it more reliable. They allow us to offer more service with the same buses. And guess what? Boston's actually one of the places in the United States doing the best work on bus lanes. We can, we can also make transit better by redesigning individual routes. You can look at a route and say, that route doesn't make sense. We can do better with that. And guess what? That's, some of that's already going on here. And we can also make transit service better by simply adding service, put more buses out there, add frequency. So what I'm gonna ask today is a really big question. Why should you redesign a network at all? What are the benefits of redesigning a network as opposed to simply adding more service, as opposed to um, simply redesigning individual routes, or as opposed to adding bus lanes? And I think there's a couple of good reasons for doing it. And I'll start with the one that most people talk about, but this isn't actually the important one. So if you haven't read Human Transit, you should. It is a book that's really about how transit works. And Jarrett Walker talks about trade-offs. And this is a classic example of that. If you cover a smaller area with your network, you can offer more frequency. 
So this is something that a redesign could do. What I will say is we didn't do this in Houston. We didn't actually take service away from any neighborhoods. We did do something else related, though, that can prove to be very useful, which is we focused service. We said, if you have two bus routes within walking distance, might it not be better to have a single bus route that runs more frequently? There's a lot of opportunity to rethink a network and make the service more frequent by concentrating it more in key corridors. So that's one thing a redesign can do. A redesign can also change how a network connects to rapid transit. We had new rail lines. We had a new chance to connect to them. We said, your buses can now feed into rapid transit. And what that can mean is we have better crosstown service, because not everything goes downtown. And guess what? When we're talking about regional rail, this might be a really relevant discussion. A network redesign can increase frequency on the same streets, because if you have a street right now that has three routes on it, and every one of those routes runs every, I don't know, every 30 minutes, you could have a single route that runs every 10 minutes. So simply redesigning the network can add frequency without taking service away anywhere. We can introduce new services. We can put sort of robo buses out there or have community connectors or circulators that replace some of the bus routes that really don't work well as bus routes. We can straighten routes in a wholesale way, do multiple routes in a corridor together so one of those routes becomes the nice straight one, the other ones pick up the miscellaneous places. We can make trips more direct so that if you make a transfer, you make that transfer in a different place than you did before. And I would say really importantly, we can make the system more legible. We undervalue this, but a good transit system is easy to understand and I would argue most bus networks aren't. But I would say the most fundamental benefit of redesigning is summed up by this. This is the number 11 Nance bus in Houston, and this started out in the 1920s as the number 11 Nance streetcar. It looked like this. It ran straight down Nance Street, and it ran to downtown Houston. This is the number 11 Nance bus. It has gotten longer on the end. It has gotten detoured to serve more destinations, and TxDOT built a freeway, cut off Nance Street, and the Nance bus no longer runs on Nance Street. A typical bus network is a series of historic accidents piled on top of each other, a series of individual decisions which each made sense by themselves, but which added together create a totally irrational network. Most places in the United States need better bus service, and we have lots of tools to do it. I would say that network redesigns are a useful tool that solves some of those problems. They are definitely not some kind of magic thing that solves everything and the places that are doing the best are using all of these tools together. And with that, I will plug my book and my Twitter, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the presentations. Thank you, Christoph. And as, he, as you would all note, uh, all the speakers so far have had um, different reports, different publications, and different books that you can all look up. Again, if you want more information on the speakers, you can go to the website, you can follow them on Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. Um, but we are going to shift gears again, um, and we are going to uh, invite uh, one of two Livable Street speakers that are coming here tonight. Um, and I'm very excited to introduce you to Ambar, um, who, among many things at Livable Streets, uh, is uh, managing our Emerald Network. Who here has heard of the Emerald Network? Um, yeah, it doesn't need an introduction. I'm not going to give you the spiel, 200 miles, blah, blah, blah. We're working on it. Um, actually, specifically, Ambar's working on it. She's going to tell you more about it, and she's going to focus on the costs and the different kinds of costs we need to consider when we're building a network like this. So I'm going to invite Ambar up. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Time is a very oppressive construct, uh, but I'm going to get this done in seven minutes, so let's see where we go. All right, so um, I can't talk about myself without talking about my family and where I'm from. So for me, I'm from... I can't figure it out. I'm too tired. Oh, it's on? All right, cool. Reclaiming my time. Anyway, um, I'm from Jersey. Uh, my family's from Georgia, and uh, I've lived some places in between. But being raised in an intergenerational household, using different modes of transit um, and transportation, I consider myself from the Deep South. Um, with that comes some heavy history. Uh, my cousin 
and I were the first ones in our family to be born with civil and human rights, which means our, in our family, we are the first to, um, use, to be a part of desegregated schools, use desegregated buses, and the first to have um, access to resources and jobs with legal protection from discrimination. So uh, these experiences inform who I am, and it also informs the work that I do, which centers mobility, justice, and history which is why I'm really excited to be here at Livable Streets. As Stacey said, I'm program director here, figuring out ways to connect our three programs, Vision Zero, Better Buses, and of course, the Emerald Network. So um, with me being here, it's been six months, but a lot of exciting things have happened so far. For instance, uh, we've been featured in Boston Magazine, we've influenced some hiring at the city of Boston, and among some other things that you can read on this screen, we just turned five years old, which is really exciting. Uh, you can do better than that, but whatever. So um, <laughs> anyway, but with that and doing all that progress in six months, I'm really excited to see what we can do um, to go from this to this in 10 years and make sure that we are creating our greenways. Um, but first, before we do that, I just want to acknowledge that in order to get to this vision and make it a true reality, um, we need to do two things. One, look to the past and some things that we've done. And two, realize that Olmsted, Ryan Gravel, and, the, um, and Mr. Hammond, who created the High Line, these are not new ideas. These are things, um, creating greenways are things that Native people have done in this land and in this country for generations before we even got here. So it's important that we acknowledge that as we um, talk about greenways. So first, we're going to talk about the New York High Line. Um, it's about 1.5 miles, and it's about 10 years old, right over in our competitor city, New York. And the other place where I just came from, um, came from Atlanta with the Belt Line, which is, has seven miles completed of 22 miles of um, a cool old loop of multi-use trails. So I know when it comes to construction costs, consultants, mulch, asphalt, concrete, you know, one of the big questions is when it comes to 200 miles of greenways, how much does this cost? Which is a valid press question. Um, and it's definitely more than a pretty penny. Uh, but I'll be pulling up some costs of another kind that we may have forgotten about. For example, uh, with the High Line, even though it had about 8 million people to visit in 2016 um, and spurred tons of economic development, uh, because of the swath of inequality that this transformed in New York, uh, even its founder said that it was considered an ultimate failure. Moving forward with the Belt Line, they're not the only person, um, or sorry, well, the way we think of these things, they might as well be people. But um, the way in which we think about the Belt Line, too, with their insights report that they conducted in 2018, 37% of respondents recorded that um, displacement was a big characteristic that they identified the Belt Line with. So not to pick on Atlanta or New York, um, it's not just them. This is happening all over cities um, where displacement is being grappled with, the enjoyment of greenways, and who is this really for? And these are things that we definitely need to keep in consideration for the Emerald Network as we move towards um, 10 years until we get our vision. So, um, yeah. One of the things I thought was really interesting uh, was the founder of co-founder of the, of the High Line asking, well, what could we have done to kind of just make sure this thing never happened? Well, do you remember the slide of all our wins that we had? One of them was um, Boston Magazine interviewed us to ask what were our big ideas to transform transportation in Metro Boston. And um, I think it's kind of funny because it's not that big of an idea, but it's kind of cool because we are doing this right now, um, listening to community and hearing what they have to say. Uh, what I've been doing for the last six months is talking to all these folks and others along the Emerald Network, particularly uh, Columbia Road, and asking them, what, is, what, what are those things that you want us to know, and what are those things you want us to do? Um, and here is some budget, some itemized things that they would like for us to invest in as we're working on the Emerald Network. Um, one of them is uh, making sure that they're, we're thwarting displacement. Another one is making sure we have green space. Of course, increased transit, um, more options for transportation, and really summed up well from my colleague, um, they would like to be able to enjoy these amenities with protection from traffic violence and from police. So as we think about this and all the wisdom that community holds, um, we do have hope. There are some benefits of the Emerald Network that our predecessors did not have um, as we think about all these things that we have under construction. For example, we do not own all the land that's along the Emerald Network, so that's a big plus. And two, we would not be able to, and I definitely would not be able to, manage this program without the help of all of our community partners, which I know are in the room as we speak. 
Um, another thing that we are much afforded with Boston having one of the highest capita of educational um, institutions in the area um, is foresight. To understand that um, segregation, displacement, and other injustices are not a thing of the past. They're still well and alive today, and disinvestment is still running rampant. Um, so when we think about greenways, we ha especially with black, brown, and indigenous communities, uh, the first thing we need to really think about is how they're greatly impacted by traffic crashes, climate change, and other injustices, just to name a few. But I know that Boston, um, being here, they have a reputation of wanting to be the best, and after living in seven cities, I can say that's debatable. Um, but <laughs> but um, I do know that Boston has an opportunity that a lot of the cities that I lived in don't, which is they have 70 opportunities to get this right for our rich and resilient communities that are here in Metro Boston, which means that you all, the practitioners in the room, have 70 plus opportunities to get it right. So um, I know you're probably wondering, so how do we do it? Oh my gosh, I'm so glad you asked. Uh, I have some of the things that are very easy and of course very cheap, if not free to do, um, are very few. So one, we can think about how we reform RFPs to give commu uh, community members direct access to capital. We can grapple with our internalized racism and systemic racism and truly just acknowledge the landscape that we're working in. This is not easy work and as we've talked about things being data-driven and community-driven, we have uh, a lot of work to do. But I'll leave you with this. Um, as we approach this new decade and building what is the Emerald Network, I have um, a couple ideas. But for you, for us as practitioners in a city, we have to ask ourselves, what are we willing to invest in? Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Ambar. One thing that I want to shout out um, is uh, when Ambar joined us six months ago, I think we handed her a list of 140 people to reach out to like on day one. And we're like, so here's who you have to get to know. And I think you've met with all of those people now, correct? Um, yeah. And so, you know, we really... <laughs> Um, as we've discussed, the Emerald Network is a people network too, and that's what we hope to convey. But if you do want to learn more about those 70 miles that we're still building, um, head to our Emerald Network website. Um, and I, I would say one other thing to note is that um, the city of Boston has made Columbia Road a priority, and um, we'll have a dedicated staff person working hand in hand with Livable Streets in 2020 to begin that process. So let's congratulate the city. Um, all right, and our last part one speaker is um, the great-great-grandmother of the Emerald Network, um, our first Emerald Network program manager who's since um, lived many lives, but we like to say we gave her her start, um, Alice Brown, who's going to tell you stories from back alleys. Good evening, friends and future friends. I'm thrilled to be at Livable Streets 10 in 1 Talks tonight. This is not my first rodeo on this stage, but it is the first time I've gotten to talk about something that is not what I do professionally. This is just something that I'm such a nerd, I think about it in my free time. Um, you might not associate Boston with alleys, so I want you to close your eyes for a minute. Close your eyes. And picture a Boston alley. What comes to mind? Is it a place you like to visit or a place you try to avoid? <laughs> Is it a place that you um, have ever walked down it or you tried not to walk down it? Is it a place with bricks or does it have cobblestones? Does it have a mural? Is there too much parking there? Are you alone there? What is, what is that feeling? And if I don't mention it tonight, I want you to tweet it in the tweet that I just tweeted. Just comment below. Um, if Boston isn't a place you associate with alleys, except maybe in the Back Bay or the South End, it might be because there's not a comprehensive alley network here. They're just sort of leftover scraps all over the place. And in 2015, Walk Boston did a tour of six downtown Boston alleys, and I thought, huh, this is interesting. I bet there's more than six. And so I've been trying to find them ever since and leading some really random tours like this one in Charlestown. 
Tonight, I'm going to use the term alleys really broadly. I'm going to include pedestrian passageways and building cut-throughs and reclaimed plazas, though I'll let Jacob talk more about that later, public stairs, and then lanes that are chaired both by cars and by pedestrians. Collectively, all of these alleys are mostly thanks to the fact that there was a much more fine-grained street network in the past, and most of you know this. Um, and I'm going to also try to tell you tonight about places that you can find within half a mile of where we're sitting, but obviously there are many, many more all over the place. But just because a space looks like a pedestrian space that belongs to history doesn't mean it wasn't once owned by cars. And you'd be surprised to discover which parts of the city have been for cars or not been for cars at different points in time. Some of these places have been reclaimed much more recently than you'd expect. I'm going to start with Pie Alley. It's a great example of one of those historic connections. So it's right in downtown. I've tried to color code this so the little orange star is us and there's a little line for where we're going. Um, Pie Alley gets its name from the fact that there was pied type, which was like a mess of all the little type pieces that were dumped out by 19th century printers. Um, and just in the time that I've been tracking alleys, it has changed quite a bit. Um, if you're not someone who normally finds alleys, it's because they don't have crosswalks when they meet the actual vehicular street network, and so you have to go just a little bit out of your way to find them. It's also possible that you don't use alleys very often because they form a mid-block crossing between two blocks that are, aren't very far apart to begin with, and there's almost always a parallel route. The only reason you'd take Spring Lane is because you think it's slightly cuter than Water Street or because you're trying to find the bookstore. It doesn't serve a lot of important transportation purposes. The perfect excuse to take a mid-block crossing, though, is on Winter Place. It is a delight. It has been well lit, and there's a whole circulation of new murals that are in there over the last few years um, that are designed to make it feel safe and friendly, even though it's narrow enough that you could believe you're in a different time or a different country. City Hall Avenue is another delight, partially because it got these lovely cafe lights in August and then scaffolding, but hopefully the cafe lights will come back. I also love it because it takes you from the front door of old City Hall to the front door of new City Hall as it becomes Court Square and then Franklin Street, which is another alley. Winthrop Lane has had a permanent art installation since 1985, when Kate Burke installed nearly five, sorry, 100 bronze brick-sized plaques that commemorate different things about Boston. Here I've got the Johnson Wing of the Boston Public Library and the exact distance to the North Pole, but you can find a bunch of other things there too. It also is great because it's short, but it connects to two building cut-throughs. So to the east is 75 and 101 Federal, and to the west is 101 Arch. 101 Arch connects Art Street to Summer Street. It also has entrances to the downtown crossing station, and it contains the historic 1873 building facade and its totally awesome spiral staircase. Some buildings in downtown Boston, actually most buildings in downtown Boston, have some kind of privately owned public space in their lobbies. You're supposed to be allowed to be there, but not a lot of the codes tell you that you're really welcome to like stay and hang out in the lobby. But building cut-throughs are great, particularly on a rainy day. I really like Lafayette Center. Um, you can go up these stairs. You can follow the lights that literally run down the hall. You can go through a rotating photography exhibition and find yourself in Macy's. You've traveled two-tenths of a mile indoors, and if you want to go farther, just go down to the train station and continue on the red and orange line platforms. I also enjoy Hamilton Place. Despite the fact that there are these huge orange signs for the corner mall, it looks like a dead end. But you go into that little door, and it takes you onto Winter Street or Washington Street, which, you might be interested to know, have been at least partially pedestrianized since 1978. Franklin Street also created some more downtown crossing pedestrian space that's really nice. It took it back from the road network and kicked off a process for creating the plaza that I think Jacob might include in his talk later. And it's a really wonderful place to sit on stairs, but the stairs don't take you anywhere. Unlike Governor's Alley, which connects to Province Street and Bosworth Street right next to Marliov, public stairs can actually be found all over the city, anywhere before the ADA official rules went into effect, but they're not all from the 17th century. A lot of modernist and brutalist buildings have really cool ramps and stairs that run up and through them without actually going indoors. You can find this at City Hall, but you can't experience it at City Hall, but if you go to Harvard Square, you'll find that the Carpenter Center has a really great example that connects Quincy to Prescott, and also you can go through the Charles Hotel. 
At the top of Governor's Alley stairs and around the corner is Chapman Place. If you want to avoid the Instagram crowds of Beacon Hills, Acorn Street, I recommend doing a photo shoot here. You've got cobblestones and it's a slightly more urban feel. And then there's Quaker Lane. It's the newest set of old alleys that are being reintroduced to the system between Congress and Devonshire. There's a whole new pattern of paths that are just now being reopened by the surrounding development. And with that, I encourage you to head out, find the alleys of Boston or wherever your city journey takes you, find ones that make your trip a little faster or at least a little less mundane. Who's gonna go spend some time in a creepy back alley tomorrow? Yeah. Um, all right. That is the first set of talks. And you are in luck. All of our speakers roughly stayed on time, which means you get your full intermission. Um, so uh, you've got a full 20 minutes or so to grab a drink, um, grab some more snacks. You can use the restrooms. Um, I would also encourage you to talk to one person um, that you haven't met yet, make a new friend. And then when I harass you to come sit down, um, be obedient. So I'll see you in 20 minutes. Okay. All right. Thanks for coming here and talking to us tonight. Would you mind telling me your name and where you're from and also what your affiliation is with all this transit talk? Uh, my name is Matt Donovan. I'm from Charlestown and my association is I am a daily commuter. I'm, I'm a resident of the city of the area so it affects all of us. What's your commute like on a day-to-day? -day? My commute's an 11.7 mile bike ride each way through beautiful scenic coastal ocean front to intense city slash industrial zone. I cross many different uh, borders as I go to those 11 miles and I travel every different direction multiple times because of the waterways and bridges I need to uh, navigate. Wow. Wow. Um, and you do this on a daily basis? I start in Boston, then I go to Everett, then I go to Chelsea, then I go to Boston, then I go to Winthrop, and I go back to Boston. So I'm starting in Boston, I run through Boston, I leave, and I come back and I arrive back in Boston. So what about from these five talks we've heard so far might have spoken to you in the way that you have to do your commute every day? Um, I, I tell you what did speak to me is rearranging our bus line, what Christoph or, or Christopher was speaking of. I, I like that idea a great deal. We, um, one of the great, I think, uh, I forget who said it, one of the worst lines in, in society is, that's the way we always do it. I forget what her name was, but uh, she's quoted as saying, and if that's the way we always do it, it doesn't always mean it's, it's right. So redesigning our bus system, and I like the way that he said that we can get out to various areas that aren't served on weekends and off hours and such. So get more people on buses, it'd be easy, especially those that don't want to cycle. I'd, I'd say first choice is to cycle and get healthy. But I know it just doesn't work for everybody in a night like this evening where it's wet and you know, not everybody enjoys getting splashed in the face on a... Or wearing that awesome rain gear. Oh, that's not right, yeah. Last thing, what would you like to tell everybody watching online about the Street Talks 10 and 1? Safety. Human safety is, is, prim is, is primary. And if it affects you, and you and, or something affects you that, that, we, that has changed due to safety, Sorry, but it's it's the most important thing is safety is us slowing down if need be or us um, uh, limiting our exposure to the roadways because we just need to be safer. It's just ins it's so sad and insane that we we, we die from uh, our own our own mobility and our own uh, time exposed to each other. I guess That's good. That's safety. That's Thank what you I. Very much. I appreciate it. Cheers. Ryan is nice enough to take a few minutes of his intermission to spend some time talking to people online. Thank you. All right, Ryan, so let's start again. Yeah. Tell me, uh, and this time we'll do this. Okay. Where do you live? What do you do? And then what brought you here tonight? Okay, so I live in Jamaica Plain. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a civil engineer at HDR. Um, so, but I do a, lot, a bit of uh, transportation planning in addition. Mm -hmm. And I'm here tonight to see, honestly, a lot of people who I follow on Twitter and have been sort of following the conversation in Boston, um, see them in person, see, uh, get to meet them and see what they're all about. You're looking up your Twitter friends. Yeah, That's yeah. cool. And adding more to the list as well. Nice. Yeah. How do you guys talk on Twitter? What are you talking about? Uh, I tweet a lot about bikes. Um, I follow more conversation about transit, but I'm not 
especially knowledgeable in that. So that's kind of why I'm here to, to learn more about that. Okay, cool. Is there a hashtag in particular people should follow on Twitter if they want to follow the conversations? Um, I actually don't know. I've just sort of found accounts through different people that I follow already and who they're retweeting. I don't have a particular hashtag that I look for. Oh, that's totally okay. <laughs> so now I did ask you earlier about your commute. Tell me what your daily commute is like. Uh, so I fortunately get to walk only five minutes to the Orange Line Station, Stony Brook, um, and take that about 20 minutes to Downtown Crossing, and then it's just another like six minute walk from there. So on a smooth day, it's not bad, like 30, 35 minutes. That's um, good. I can bike sometimes. Okay. Uh, and you feel safe doing that? The, uh, I can bike down the Southwest Corridor for the first stretch and then Columbus, and up until that point, uh, it's not bad. Mm -hmm. But once I hit downtown when that bike lane sort of peters away, mm -hmm. It's uh, the last five minutes. It's just too stressful, honestly, for me even. And I used to be more confident in biking, but I think uh, over time, it's just kind of you're, you're playing the odds in some situations. Um, so really, that last five minutes is a big enough impediment for me that I don't bike as often as I would. Yeah, I've lived in other cities, so I just have to ask: Were you more confident biking in other cities or just in the Jamaica Plain area? Um, I feel honestly. Sometimes more comfortable in Boston than other cities simply because it's oftentimes more difficult for cars to go what feels like a like more lethal speed. Um, like a city like Salt Lake that I've been in, um, even if you have uh, a slightly wider infrastructure, uh, cars are just on average going way faster. And to me that feels like a higher risk than getting hit by a, a car that's maybe going 20 or 25. Or not so, at all. Let's yeah. hope we're not at all yeah. knocking on wood. Um, all right, last question yeah. for you then. From the first five talks that we've heard out of the 10 and 1 tonight, uh, did anything in particular jump out at you because of your commute or, or your daily experience? Um, maybe not related to my commute, but Alice's talk on alleys, I think, just like was something totally unexpected and it was just such a joy. Like, I think that's been. Um, my favorite so far, I have to say. Just it's it's so out of the blue and something that uh, in our normal day to day I'm not really paying attention to. Right, right, right. Last thing. Yeah. Advice for our online audience before we sign off. Um, join the Twitter conversation because you can meet a lot of cool people from there. That's right. And the hashtag tonight is hashtag Street Talk Ten and One. Cool. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Annie here again with Ashley Molina at the Street Talks 10 and 1. Um, we're doing this during the intermission. There are five more talks coming up, so stay with us. But in the meantime, we're going to ask Ashley a few questions about her commute and stuff like that. So Ashley, tell us where you live, what you do, and what brought you to Street Talks 10 and 1 tonight. Okay, so I live in South Boston on West 3rd Street. Um, I work for the MBTA. And what brought me to the Street Talks? Well, um, I'm a fan. Um, I admire a lot of the people that are here to talk. Allison Brown, um, Amber, she's one of my good friends. And honestly, it's just generally things that I'm very interested in about. And I have a lot of friends here, so why not? What do you do for the MBTA? Um, I work for the Customer Technology Department. Um, and I focus on bus real-time information and operations. That's working, by the way. I appreciate that. I ride the 86 a lot. Yeah, thank you. But I bet you get a few complaints once in a while. Many. We get many. But, I mean, rightly so, right? I'm also a writer, so I understand, um, and I'm happy. Those complaints help us make it better, so we're, we're okay with that. Fair enough. So tell us a little about your commute. Um, so I live in Southie, and at the time, um, at the time being, our offices are at 185 Neeland in the Mast like building so I usually either take the 9 from the stop closest to my house and then I take it to Broadway and take it one station to South Station and walk to the office or I ride my bike and it's like a 15 minute commute um, and I, I, I'm fortunate enough to use the new um, Summer Street bike lane, buck bi bus bike lane um, so that's nice um, but yeah and that goes all the way from where you are to where you need to be, the, Summer, the Somerville bike lane? Uh, Summer Street. Summer Street. Summer yeah. Street. So, no, but Southie's pretty good for biking. Okay. If they don't have bike lanes, at least the streets feel pretty safe. Mm -hmm. So I usually go like down Southie and make a right on A Street, like in the seaport. They have not protected bike lanes, but bike lanes. And then I make a left on Summer Street, which either has protected bike lanes or then I jump on the new... Um, 
bus bike lane, which is just a chunk. So tell us a little before we close out here, um, there have been five out of the 10 in one talks tonight. Anything in particular jump out to you because of your commute or because of your work? Potentially just because of my interest. And because, so um, I lived in Paris where the alleys are pretty much like are very activated. And so right near my old job, there was an alleyway. There was like um, a Mexican bar, like a small pizza joint. And then there was like a bunch of street art and graffiti and people like sat on like street furniture in the in the alleyway. So that brought me back to that. And so I really like that talk because it is something that I think we're missing in Boston. And it was refreshing to hear that people are thinking about it. Okay, Stacy's gonna wrap it up now. She wants us to wrap it up. Last thing, piece of advice for people watching online. Piece of advice. If you can, walk, take a bike, take the tea, take the bus, take anything except a car, I strongly suggest you do so. For the environment and for your health, for the health of our city and your happiness, it's, it's really beneficial. Best advice, nice job, Thanks. thank you so much. Okay. Thanks. Uh, stay tuned. Stacy's about to bring us back on. Um, and I, um, as we're transitioning into the um, to the section of the night, I would just say we are um, always excited by the folks who join us tonight. Um, and I'm I will bring up Louisa Gag in a minute. Um, but what I wanted to do is say the first two talks tonight are focused on the city of Boston, um, and we are excited. You know, we always have a couple of uh, stories about Boston. But one thing that I want to remind folks is that just a couple of years ago, we were sitting in this room saying, the city of Boston needs like two more staff. How are they going to get all this work done? They don't have enough people. And many of you showed up at city council hearings, supported the decision the mayor made to add $5 million and 20 new staff to the budget. Um, yeah. And then the city went through a long and arduous process of hiring people. And what I would love to do is invite anyone who is from the city of Boston to stand tonight. We have many of the new hires in the room and old, everyone, city of Boston. Vineet. <laughs> Woo! Uh, Chief Osgood is here. <laughs> Um, and there's just a, this is a small portion. I got a few emails from folks, but we do, we have hired these folks. Um, there's this a massive team. Every time I go into City Hall, I turn a corner and see a new person, a new person, a new person. And that's why we're going to have uh, many more bus lanes in the new year. Hopefully many more bike lanes in the new year. And we're going to accelerate process. So if you saw someone you didn't know, please go introduce yourself and then let them know what you care about so they can work on it. Um, <laughs> all right, so um, we are going to transition to our first talk of the night. Um, we, who here has heard of Go Boston 2030? Who here worked on Go Boston 2030? Yeah, we got a few folks in the room. Um, so I am not going to say too much, but as we announced last year, Livable Streets is committed to making sure that Go Boston 2030 stays alive and is implemented in the next decade. Um, and the person on our staff who's sort of been tasked with achieving that is Louisa Gag. Um, and she is here to tell you a little bit more about what she has been up to. So Louisa, come on up. Hi, everyone. So tonight, I'm going to talk about the project that I've been working on to assess the city of Boston's progress on implementing their Go Boston 2030 plan. But before I start, I want to thank the Barr Foundation for investing in Go Boston 2030 literally from the beginning, and particularly for funding livable streets to do this accountability work. So thank you to the Barr Foundation. <laughs> <clears throat> So that being said, my name is Louisa Gag, and I'm the Public Policy and Operations Manager at Livable Streets. And for the past year, I have been living, breathing, eating, sleeping, dreaming, Go Boston 2030. Um, and I literally have it with me here. I carry it with me everywhere. Um, so what is Go Boston 2030? So as Stacy just asked, many of you folks in the room know what it is and have heard of it, but in case you need a refresher, Go Boston 2030 is the city of Boston's um, mobility plan. <clears throat> and it envisions a city where all residents have better and more equitable travel choices. It was released in March 2017, so almost three years ago, and it includes many 
measurable aspirational targets, including around mode shift, which I'm going to talk more about later. Um, thousands of Bostonians were engaged in the creation of the plan. And there are 58 projects and policies in it, ranging from the Columbia Road Greenway, which you heard a little bit about earlier tonight, to uh, rapid bus on Mass Ave. The plan is 224 pages long. But the next steps for, um, for accountability, monitoring, and continued community engagement only take up half of one of those pages. And Go Boston 2030 itself calls out the importance of an accountability and engagement entity saying, without a mechanism to ensure that progress is being made, Go Boston 2030 might sit on a shelf. So we have made it our mission to make sure that Go Boston 2030 does not sit on a shelf. <laughs> we are building an accountability report that will evaluate the city of Boston's progress on the 30 or so early action items in the plan to be released in March. We want to measure how the city is doing and whether they're on track to meet their goals. To help inform our report, we spent the summer and much of the fall doing community outreach, talking to people all over the city, um, letting them know what projects were in the plan that were coming to their neighborhood, and hearing from them um, about their experiences getting around the city. So while many of you in the room have heard of Go Boston 2030, that's really not the case when you go out and talk to the average person. And so it felt really important to be out there talking to people reminding them, kind of letting them know about what the city had committed to, and also f hearing from them about their priorities and issues. <clears throat> that being said, some people that we talked to had heard of the plan, like Mayor Walsh. <laughs> um, and over the summer and the fall, doing this community engagement, we heard of a lot of opinions, some of which I'm going to share tonight. But we also dug into the data, and we'll be reporting back on some of the city's progress on their mode shift and other goals. So I'm going to share four takeaways or themes so far. And to jump in, what did we hear? So the first takeaway is that the system is not working for people. People's bus, buses and subways are not showing up on time. They feel unsafe while they're walking and biking. And it's really hard to get around. Um, and, and their frustration was really clear and something that we heard a lot. And these issues absolutely echo the priorities that are featured in Go Boston 2030. So improving safety, expanding access, and ensuring reliability, um, which really speaks to the strength of the plan and the importance of the plan. We also heard that um, people were really excited about the projects included in Go Boston 2030. So just to share a quick story, we heard from a man who works near BU and would sometimes drive to work, and he would usually just park on the street and feed the meter. But when the city upped the parking meter fees this summer, it suddenly became cheaper to park in a garage for the day. And he said immediately he noticed way more availability of street parking. And he said to us, this was intentional on the city, this was unintentional on the city's part. Imagine what they could do if they were trying. <laughs> so um, the city in November released um, an update on their website on many of the projects in Go Boston 2030, which we were really excited to see. And they shared that they were implementing 21, um, already in implementation of 21 out of the 58 projects in the plan. And projects like bike share expansion and the bus only lane on Washington Street in Rosendale are already having a huge impact on people. Um, and we are so excited by the expanded team and the new staff who were acknowledged just a bit ago um, and can already see that this is making a big difference on pace and quality of projects implemented. <clears throat> However, we're not seeing an impact on mode shift. So this is data. Um, as you can see from this graph, it's showing American Community S Survey data um, showing that there has not been a significant change in any mode since Go Boston 2030 was developed, whether that's driving alone, taking transit, um, walking, carpooling, or biking. And Go Boston 2030 laid out um, ambitious aspirational targets around mode shift, aiming for a 50% reduction in the percentage of people driving alone and a 30% increase in the percentage of people taking transit. Um, 
<clears throat> However, in the five years of data since GoBoston 2030 has been developed, we're, s we're actually seeing a very slight decrease in the percentage of people taking transit to work from 34 to 32%. And while we are seeing a slight increase in the percentage of people walking from 14 to 15%, there has been no change in the percentage of people driving alone or biking. So clearly there is a lot of work left to be done in order to start seeing progress on these goals. So we will be releasing our report in March of 2020. So this will be on the third year anniversary of Go Boston 2030's release. And in our report, we'll be providing a status update and evaluation of the early action projects in Go Boston 2030. We'll also be doing a deep dive into several projects, including evaluating the city's progress on building out their bike network. And we'll be sharing updates on other aspirational targets beyond mode shifts, so around safety, reliability, access, and more. We'll also be providing recommendations on what we think the city needs to get done in order to stay on track. Um, and while this first report comes out in March of 2020, we'll also be releasing reports every two years going up until 2030. So stay tuned, there's a lot more to come. And I feel a little bit like Greta Thunberg when I say this, but there are 11 years left until 2030. Um, we're three years in. Where are we gonna be when we're five years in, in 2022? How many projects will the city of Boston have started to implement by then? And will we be seeing any progress on mode shift? I just wanna leave you with this. Go Boston 2030 is a strong plan. It's a needed plan. It's an aspirational plan and it's a feasible plan. And together with many of you and with the city of Boston, we are making sure that Go Boston 2030 does not sit on a shelf. Thank you. Um, yes, so, you know, hold your calendars for some point in March. Rain, snow, blizzard, you know, tea, disaster. We will be sharing the full report with all of you um, to help us all make progress. Um, all right, so shifting gears, um, we did want to highlight one of the sort of um, fun projects that is happening in the city of Boston. And so we've invited um, Jacob Wessel, who's been doing... Um, placemaking, and that can be a big, crazy word. Where, Jacob, where are you? Oh, hi, get up here. <laughs> um, usually they're like lurking and waiting. Um, so I'm gonna invite Jacob to share a little bit about some of the, the work that the city has been doing in the last couple of years to um, make the city more livable for everyone. So welcome up. Great, so hello everyone. Uh, I'm Jake Wessel from the city of Boston and I have the pleasure of getting to talk to you tonight about plazas and some of the work that I get to do to expand uh, thriving public spaces in the city of Boston. So when I'm out talking to people around uh, the city, I hear from everyone that they want more spaces to enjoy with their neighbors, with their friends, and they want them on every street corner in the city of Boston and in every neighborhood, yet that's not really the case with our streets. And so I'm gonna talk a bit about how we can really expand and scale the number of these spaces and how it can take us not 11 years to get there. Uh, so to start off, this is a slip lane. It shouldn't be that uh, remarkable to any of us, but it's a, a piece of infrastructure that really says if you're walking across the street, you have to stop on that tiny little concrete island to be able to keep going. And it says you just have to do that just so someone in a car can make a right turn a little bit faster. If you're a pedestrian, this says, screw you. <laughs> now, this is Copley Square in 1960. If you can see st straight down the middle of Copley Square, Huntington Ave cut through and there were all these little islands out there and it was really hard for someone as a pedestrian to cross and those islands really didn't do much service to anyone. But luckily, this isn't very remarkable to me, it shouldn't look familiar to many of you because today, Copley Square is a connected space that's thriving and civic and uh, a pleasure to hang out in on a nice day. So. How do we take that example of connecting streets and reclaiming them for people and expand them throughout the city and uh, the region as a whole? So last year, the city of Boston launched this tactical public realm guidelines, and that enables us to use a variety of different tools to make these types of spaces uh, easier, quicker, and cheaper than we would typically would. And we use materials like planters, paint, movable seating to be able to carve out those public spaces and reclaim them for people in a short period of time. 
So, and uh, we've already started doing this. So on Harrison Ave in Chinatown, uh, people have been talking about creating a public plaza here for at least 25 years. And this August, in a matter of seven days, the street was reclaimed, half the street and that slip lane on the upper right hand corner was reclaimed for people. And now there's thousands of square feet of new pedestrian space and hundreds of people enjoy the public plaza in Chinatown every single day. So that begs the question, where next? Where's the next Phillips Square? So what we want to do is we want to look for those slip lanes, those redundancies in the road network that really don't do much service to anyone. They're not doing service to pedestrians. Maybe they're doing a little service to cars, but do we really care? And uh, we want to reclaim them. So uh, looking at Liberty Square in downtown Boston, we look at a street and it's really not serving anyone. It's definitely not serving those people trying to have a nice time grabbing lunch. It's not serving that woman walking across the street. And so we want to be able to transform it. So this summer for one day, working with some great fellows from the Office of New York Mechanics, reclaim the street for people. It's designed a bit better for people trying to enjoy their lunch. And it's gonna be the site of the city of Boston's public plaza in 2020. And what's remarkable about this is instead of waiting 25 years from full concept to sort of waiting for the right perfect set of circumstances because of those guidelines, because of these new tools, we can do it much quicker, within a year. We wanna pilot something, we want the engagement to be that event on the sidewalk as opposed to tons of public meetings that all of you are familiar with going to. And we want to be able to design it much quicker and be able to build it quickly so that we can reclaim that space for people. And ultimately, it'll look like places like this in Washington DC and Montreal, where that street is reclaimed, but it's not perfect. There aren't beautiful painted planters there. There's not amazing public art, but this space has been reclaimed from the car, given back to the people, and it'll stay that way for the foreseeable future. So in thinking about these spaces, I, I wanna offer a challenge to everyone. Where is this redundant street in your neighborhood? Where is there that slip lane that always pisses you off as you're trying to cross or maybe scares you? Where is there a space where people are clamoring to spill out into? And particularly, given some of the challenges that the city faces on a continuing basis, I wanna issue a particular challenge about engaging with small businesses. Where is there a business owner or a restaurant you patronize or somewhere that you go to on a continual basis where you can use your transportation advocacy, partner with that small business to really engage the city on creating wonderful new public spaces? And lastly, because Stacy said, well, I want you to remind people that these spaces aren't just seasonal, this isn't just fun stuff we're doing in the summer. So this is this Sunday in Thompson Square in Charlestown. Uh, turns out it was 25 degrees, it was really cold, and yet hundreds of people came out for Santa and the Mayor's Trolley Tour and they all had themselves a great time. And so, and it's hard to see, but this is actually a slip lane. So this space will become a pedestrian plaza, hopefully by next year. So let's talk afterwards. Shoot me a line. There's a form on boss.gov slash public realm where you can submit a location. I look forward to hanging out on the plaza with you. Um, I was serious when I told uh, Jacob that I wanted him to bring homework for you all, so I'll be very disappointed if he tells me that he walked away without any suggestions. Um, <laughs> so please, please, please reach, reach out. Reach out. There are so many places in the city that um, could use his work, and we are happy to put you to work. Um, so we're going to shift gears again, um, and I'm just curious, who here has been to a public meeting that was, like, painful? Yes. Um, so one of the things that we've really been excited and fortunate um, to do at Livable Streets is partner with um, Loop Lab, and I'll let them share a little bit more about the work that they do. But as you know, it's really easy to go to a public meeting and hear a few voices who you know represent the community, who are loud, who know how to seek that space. Um, and as you know from, from Amber's talk and from Louisa's talk, we are really focused on accessing people where they are on the ground. Um, and and we've been so privileged to have a media partner who's been able to capture some of those narratives. Um, so I'd love to invite Matt and Tevin up to share more about their work and for you to get to know them. Howdy, everybody. I'm Matt Alikowski. I'm program manager over at the Loop Lab in Cambridge. Um, 
quick bit about us. We're a workforce development nonprofit. Uh, we train underrepresented young adults, 18, 26 years old, in audio and video skills, along with a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, and why are we standing here at a transportation talk? Um, <laughs> because this, uh, this issue, transportation justice, is central to the population we serve. Um, and it's central to uh, so many different populations who are not standing in this room. Um, and I think that a huge piece of this is about having the conversation and how do we engage some of those pieces. And that comes into us in terms of media training as well, because when it comes down to training people to create content that engage audiences in lots of different modalities and places, these are the types of th challenges that really come up, and these are real substantial creative professional skills for folks. So, um, But I thought it'd be silly to stand here and talk about this topic entirely myself, so I brought Tevin Charles with me. Tevin Charles is an alumni everybody. of ours. Um, he is, as I've described to many people, if everyone thinks this way, Tevin thinks this way. Um, <laughs> he's the most creative person that uh, I've met in many years, and uh, I'm happy to have him here. Everybody's on their screens nowadays, especially young adults, but young adults of color seem to be on their phones a little bit more. Uh, according to a study in 2016, there's a study between ages 15 and 29 seem to consume, their, ages 15 to 29 consume more um, information on social media. They're the largest consumers, people of color. And uh, in addition to that, 13% more are on Instagram more than their white counterparts. So that brings me to question like, why aren't we using social media to, to engage young adults of color, like Instagram, Twitter, Facebook? Speak louder? <laughs> um, I, I apologize. So why aren't we using Instagram to engage young people of color who are disproportionately affected by transportation justice issues? Um, so quick anecdote from uh, one of our other trainees who we were having this conversation with on Friday night. Um, we asked the question in a group to say, why why aren't you out there advocating for this thing that impacts you so substantially? His response was, well, I'm not going to go out there and advocate for something that doesn't come into my community and contribute to my community without asking anything. Um, I need them to show up first. Um, and I thought that was a really striking piece. Um, and that there needed to be investment and engagement in them and their futures in order for them to be willing to come to the table to advocate for the thing that affects them so drastically and that they're invested in, in you know in his in his words this impacts me every single day i'm on the red line and i sit for two and a half hours sometimes on the red line to get there um and so this is real and it's in my world every single day but you know for me to actually show up and do the work in the advocacy side it, it requires that work back from the advocacy community so and uh you know tevin made a really good point about his own experience with that yeah it means a lot for me to be included on these projects with livable streets and t for mass um, being a, a black content creator, uh, most organizations don't just allow you to step in and do work for them. So me being a bike rider and, not, like I said, a content creator myself, um, it, ah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of nervous. I'm not going to lie with you. Uh, yeah, but working on the bike, bike and bus lane and the brand new opening in Austin meant a lot to me just because, like, I'm a bike rider from Cambridge. I've been riding my bike my whole entire life. I paid, like, $100 for a T-Pass, so... Anything that's trying to help me out and help the people around my community get, get to places where they need to be without the hassles, I, I'm, I enjoy to do the work. So I have a video that I did with Livable Streets for the bike and bus lane. Awesome. So we'll share this with you and uh, leave you with that. And please come back and talk to us afterwards. We're happy to have more conversations about this stuff. So. I'm Anna. I'm the director of the Austin Brighton Health Collaborative. And we have been working on getting a dedicated bus lane in the neighborhood for about a year and a half, 14,000 people ride this corridor on bus every day. So it's a really important way of moving people through this corridor more efficiently. And it's a way of, of tweaking transportation challenges in, in some key ways that can really move everybody a lot faster. Sometimes just the change has to be made and people have to see the benefits for them to really get it. The number one challenge for bus riders was just reliability on time departure overcrowding. And those are all issues that can be addressed with a dedicated bus lane. So my name's Sam Burgess. I've lived in Boston for about two years now. I moved here for grad school. But I haven't been a regular bike commuter until I moved to Boston. Some of the places I was living before that weren't quite as bike friendly, so I didn't really feel safe. One of the things that I think biking and, and walking and taking transit is so great is it's, it's 
you're sharing a public space with other people, whereas if you're not using one of those modes, you're very much in a private space and you're not really interacting with other people. So there's an element of humanity to that in that you ideally treat other people how you want to be treated and it's much easier to do that if you're walking next to someone, if you're biking alongside someone, or if you're on a bus or you're on a, the green line. My name is Justin Grizzy. I'm an MBTA bus instructor. I've been with the MBTA for 14 years. We teach our operators to be more aware of their surroundings, not so much just with cars and pedestrians, also with bicycles, uh, because now there's more bicycle traffic than ever. If there's a dedicated lane for a bus and a bike, very much um, an added advantage to cyclists as well as bus drivers. My sense is that a lot of bus drivers are pretty supportive of having this type of infrastructure because I imagine it would make their job a lot less stressful and a lot easier. With the bus lane and the bike lane, it's, we've had it in different sections of the system and it's been running great. Thank you guys. Um, for those of you who've been with Livable Streets a while, um, I can, I think we can attest that this is maybe the best quality video we have ever had come through. You, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Um, and I would just say we love working with Tevin and Matt um, as an advocate. It's incredible to just be like, can you like go out there? And, and they get it, right? Like Tevin said, he rides the bus, he rides his bike. We don't, we, you know, it's amazing to be working with such a talented team. Um, and I just want to do a plug that um, they are also working in a collaborative effort uh, with Transportation for Massachusetts and Livable Streets to tell the stories of people who um, want the state legislature to fix our transportation crisis. Um, we here, yes. <laughs> um. The Loop Lab team has been out in uh, central and western Massachusetts. They've been in Somerville. They've been in Chinatown. The first video is dropped, but expect more videos in 2020, um, telling the stories of real people who want real solutions and, and sort of breaking these narratives about the people that we talk about but don't talk to. So more to come. Be excited about these videos um, and talk to your legislators in 2020. Um, all right, so we have two talks left. I can't believe we're already toward the end of the night. Um, we. I uh, would be remiss to um, have an entire 10 and one without talking about a Greenway connection. Um, and we've done a lot of time talking about the Nipponset in the past, but we haven't spent a lot of time talking about the Mystic. Um, and so we're going to talk about, I'm going to hand this over to Amber um, to tell you about one missing connection that we are very excited about. So come on up. So my name's Amber Christofferson. I'm the Greenways Director at the Mystic River Watershed Association. I'm going to take you to the northern reaches of the Emerald Network. Um, and I want, I'm grateful to Livable Streets for spending some time to spotlight the Mystic. Uh, this is an image of the Tobin Bridge, which is considered the gateway to the Mystic River and is one of the most recognizable and tr well-traveled bridges in Boston. Uh, also, at a span of almost two miles, it is the longest bridge in New England. And I'm here today not to talk about the Tobin Bridge, but the new mid bridge across the Mystic um, that we hope will also be as iconic and well used. I'm gonna start with a little bit of background on the Mystic River and why this bridge is so important. Let's see if I have to hit it twice. Oh, maybe the animation's not working. I tried. Um, so just to give you a little bit of information, the Mystic River watershed is a network of streams, rivers, and lakes that all drain into the Mystic River. And for a sense of scale, if there were to be a map here, uh, it's slightly larger than Brooklyn and slightly smaller than Amsterdam. Both of those have one government. We have 21 local governments, so you can see our challenge. Uh, our organization works to protect water, restore habitat, build climate resiliency, and transform our parks and paths. Uh, zooming out to this image that does work, this is from the city of Boston's resilient Boston Harbor, which shows the three rivers that feed into Boston Harbor. Um, the reservations of the Mystic Charles and Neponset that were created with the Metropolitan Park Plan in 1893. However, since then, there's been quite a different um, series of investments and uses across the three rivers. 
Um, so when looking at the mystic over the past 150 years, it can be broadly characterized into three periods. Uh, the first is that of the industrial powerhouse. The Mystic and Malden Rivers were home to significant industry that changed the course of the river and created permanent barriers between local communities and their waterfronts. This is a photograph of the Monsanto site in the 1920s, which is now Encore Boston Harbor. Um, other industries in this area included Converse, the Ford Assembly Plant, and a GE facility that manufactured airplanes in World War II. Um, after more than 100 years of this industry, many of these facilities moved off of the river and dozens of sites uh, have were remained vacant and contaminated. This is the same site, the Monsanto site, uh, that was a brownfield leaching toxins into the Mystic River. We've now entered a new phase of development, which is really a renaissance for the Mystic um, and one of both restoration and development. Um, we already have an amazing restoration story of the alewife and blueback herring. Uh, both fish are anadrom anadromous, which means they spend most of their lives at sea, and then they travel to freshwater habitats to spawn. In this case, they travel seven miles to lay eggs in the Mystic Lakes. With the creation of a fish ladder and improved habitat, the Mystic now hosts the largest urban herring migration in New England. Last year, almost 800,000 fish traveled through the Mystic Lakes fish ladder, and we now have more fish than people in the watershed. Uh, and while we've seen a remarkable comeback of herring with improved infrastructure and habitat, we're still working on improving infrastructure and habitat for people. Uh, this is a Strava heat map that shows intensity of walking and biking uses. Um, and here's a shot of the, Miss, the Charles River, and you can see where everybody wants to be on the waterfront. When you go over to the Mystic, there's almost no red along the shoreline because of the lack of infrastructure. This, so this is really why we created the Mystic Greenways Initiative in 2015, which seeks to create 25 miles of parks and paths from Mystic Lakes to Boston Harbor. So to return back to the theme of restoration and development, here's a snapshot of some planned development in what we're calling the Lower Mystic area. The Lower Mystic includes Medford, Somerville, Everett, and Charlestown, slash Boston. There's some interchangeability there. Um, and uh, there's really no other area in the watershed or even the state that exemplifies development growth more than this area. Uh, the Lower Mystic Regional Working Group began in 2015 to create a plan to mitigate projected traffic impacts from the casino. Um, these are some maps from the study that was just released this spring. And to read just a small piece from that study, uh, this area is one of Massachusetts' biggest growth centers. The planned residential and commercial growth could lead to 27,000 new households and 55,000 new jobs. Collectively, this future growth could meet 5% of the state's housing needs and accommodate 20% of projected statewide employment. So that will have a huge impact on transportation, and we're using it as, as a frame for our Greenways work to create a viable active transportation network that gets cars off the road. Um, and projections aside, uh, a visual comparison highlights development growth that's taken place over the last 10 years. This is an aerial shot of, from 2009 that shows the confluence of the Mystic and Malden Rivers. They also happen to be the edges of four cities that, until recently, really turned their backs on the waterfront due to the history that I went through earlier. Um, so 2009, the only urban center here was Stations Landing, um, and you could see three sad little pieces of waterfront uh, that are all disconnected. Fast forward to 2019, we now have three urban centers here with more than 10,000 jobs and 3,000 units of housing. That's a lot for 10 years. Um, however, getting between these centers today can take somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes. Um, what this is showing is the network of existing and proposed paths. In fact, all of these are either in design or under construction. And there's two specific projects. I'm going to focus on the bridge. But the first project is the Northern Strand Extension. It's a mile-long extension that will take the 11-mile Northern Strand Community Trail from Lynn all the way to the Mystic River. Yeah. Uh, and that's slated to go under construction next year, which is really exciting. This is not a new idea, as many of these projects are. Um, this was a plan that DCR initiated 10 years ago, and now here we are today. So the design and permitting of the bridge began in 2017, 
what this bridge, uh, the design of this bridge is curved so that it maximizes views to the river, buffers from the commuter rail station, and connects to Everett on the north bank there, Somerville on the south bank, and ideally to a connection to the assembly row head house. Uh, here are a few renderings that show the profile of the bridge with assembly row on the left, and the image on the right is an eye level view looking towards Somerville from Everett. So, um, there's really a lot of reasons why this little bridge can have big impacts. It's the only off-road connection from the North Shore to Boston. It provides access to the Orange Line for Everett residents. It closes a significant gap in the East Coast Greenway. And unlike the Tobin, it's a bridge for people, not cars. So what's happening today? Um, most of the permitting and design is complete. There's still a few uh, challenges to get through, but the coalition of partners and stakeholders that are listed on this slide are going to be critical to getting to implementation. Encore has made a large financial commitment and is working to identify additional funding. Uh, each year we're making progress to connect these urban centers and the residents of the Lower Mystic. The small but mighty bridge is the linchpin in a growing network that will knit together the edges of Medford, Everett, Somerville, and Boston. We're advocating for the state to provide the last push for this project to get over the finish line. So stay tuned for updates in 2020. Thanks for your time. Um, all right, we are down to our last speaker, and uh, I, I couldn't be more excited. What I would say, um, you know, we've talked a lot about a collaboration. We've talked a lot about, um, you know, things like a, a pedestrian bridge, but um, to an entire bus network redesign. But um, what I think I'm most proud of as an advocate is being annoying. <laughs> um, <laughs> And what I would say is, you know, tomorrow night there is a Kenmore Square uh, meeting, and if you want to go be annoying about that project, please go. Um, the I-90 project is not done, and we still need a great walking, biking connection, and we still need comments, so please be annoying and tell the state that you need something about it. Um, we had a great uh, North Washington, no, Northern Avenue bridge meeting tonight where we saw People First Bridge, but we are not done. We're going to be annoying together for the next year, um, and I'm excited excited to invite um, a peer and colleague and a friend who I feel like we enjoy being annoying together. Um, and that is the theme of her talk, kind of. I'm going to turn to Rebecca to let her explain. Uh, and, and I heard it in the audience. Some don't call it annoying. They call it being insufferable. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Becca Wolfson. I'm the executive director of the Boston Cycles Union. I have been called insufferable in the comments section of the Boston Globe. I wear it as a badge. Um, for those of you who don't know the Boston Cyclist Union, we advocate and we organize residents to advocate for a network of safe, separated bike lanes for people-centered streets and uh, people-focused policies. Um, I'm sure many of you in this room, if not all of you, consider yourself to be advocates. And what's a good sign of being an advocate? Some would say compromise. That can be true in some situations. And others would say it's a fierce determination to not give up, to hold our electeds and city and state officials accountable to do the right thing. And I'm going to share a story with you that involved many of the people in this room who hold that conviction and share why every step along the way was really important to be annoying, to be insufferable, and to not give up. I'm also going to give a caveat that uh, this project started in 2009. I wasn't on the scene until 2015. So if I get anything wrong, tell me later. I'm sorry. The project is the Longfellow Bridge. Uh, MassDOT held a process to reconstruct the bridge from 2009 to 2011. The bridge was in disrepair. It was falling apart. Uh, it had to be reconstructed, and there was an opportunity to reallocate the surface space. Uh, the bridge was already a really important connection for people going between Boston and Cambridge, and for the growing but fairly small bike population at the time, um, there were two travel lanes in each direction and approximately three-foot um, uh, shoulders that were used for people who were biking who were very brave. Um, so at the end of a two-year process, MassDOT determined uh, through public process and compromise um, that there would be a reduction in travel lane, 
Just kidding, not there yet. Uh, a reduction in traveling from uh, two to one in the outbound side to Cambridge, and a, a nice wide buffered bike lane would be put there, but in the inbound side, they would narrow the lanes to 11 feet, add a four and a half to five and a half bike lane, depending on pinch points, but there just wasn't enough space. They couldn't reduce that last travel lane. There would be too much traffic, and it would lead to a traffic apocalypse. Uh, uh, but we were told as advocates, you won. You're getting that one lane reduction in your wider bike lane. Be happy. Uh, there, yeah. And we weren't. So what did we do? We sent a letter. Um, so this is a letter sent by the advocates who were involved at the time. It was Livable Streets, Mass Bike, Walk Boston, Charles River Conservancy, and a very nascent Boston Cyclist Union. And the key here is us saying changes are needed, this is unsafe, we're not satisfied. But nothing changed, construction began, and the three-year construction process quickly turned into almost five. Um, and during that entire five-year period, there was only one traveling into Boston for cars, shared with people biking, and there wasn't a travel traffic apocalypse. So this was the condition for almost five years. So in October of 2017, when a handful of us got this letter from REF Sevet, is Ari in the room? No, okay. Uh, that said, you know, we've had these conditions for five years, nothing terrible is happening, we'll be fine with one traveling. What do you think? Should we give it one more push to keep it this way? I was dumb enough to say yes. <laughs> and the Boston Cyclist Union offered to take the lead because no one thought that we could win. And Livable Streets, Walk Boston, Mass Bike, Charles River Conservancy, we worked again together. So we sent a letter. We asked them to reconsider this decision and when the bridge was going to open six months later to keep it to one lane. We finally got a meeting and we're told, that's a nice idea, but no, maybe in the future. We, we won't preclude that. Um, this is what we were asking for. So in February of 2018, when commuters were rejoicing that the bridge would finally reopen, we organized. We put together a petition. We had people petitioning at every end of the bridge. We collected 3,200 signatures in three short weeks and delivered them to MassDOT. We had amazing volunteers. We organized with MGH cyclists. We got letters from elected officials, from Mayor Curtitoni, from the Cambridge city manager, from Congressman Capuano. This was a really big deal because in 2011, he was the, he still is the car guy, but in 2011, he was one of the most vocal opponents. But it was an election year. We also had data on our side. This is from the Boston Bike Counts, and that shows that it was one of the top five bike locations in the city in uh, 2017. And, and what's really important, too, is what we were saying is conditions have changed. You made this decision in 2011. It's now 2018. Boston, Cambridge, Somerville have adopted Vision Zero. MassDOT released your own complete streets guide. The bike population is booming. Uh, Beacon Street, we now have this precedence for protected bike lanes. Beacon Street had a beautiful complete streets protected bike lane project that led into this corridor. The city of Cambridge had committed to reconstructing Inman Square. The totem at Broadway and Kendall uh, showed more thousands of people biking that corridor daily, all leading to and from the Longfellow Bridge. We needed a safe connection. Uh, we delivered our petition to MassDOT. We even had the media on our side this time. And the result, we won. This was a very quick organizing campaign over four or five months. It was incredible. We haven't seen wins like this before. Um, and it really gave us the courage uh, to do it again. We repeated this on the Craigie Bridge where MassDOT was ready to implement a plan that was finalized in 2010. In 2019, we said painted bike lanes just aren't enough anymore. You've got to change this, update it, add separation. It's 2019. And unfortunately, we also had the death of a young man, Meng Jin, on that corridor, which made it easier for MassDOT to relook at that project and to actually change it, make the bike lanes wider, take space away from cars, and add a safe space. So we as advocates are not afraid to turn our elected leaders and city officials and, and city agencies into villains, but we'd much rather turn them into heroes. So, 
One of the next second chance projects that we are going to organize around and we're going to need everyone here to speak up is Beacon Street in Somerville. We have this beautiful new protected bike lane on half the corridor, on half the project because we lost half the battle last time. But what can projects like this teach us? We can lose, we can have a design, it can sit on the shelf, it can be under construction, but we can still win in the future. So stay tuned. We'll need every voice and every letter. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I wanted um, to invite Becky here tonight, partially because she's never done a 10 in 1 before, um, but just to, to leave on that note, um, you know, we've heard from 10 amazing speakers tonight, but I hope that um, you've learned something. Raise your hand if you've learned something. Okay, great. Yes. Um, are you inspired? Come on, yes. Um, you know, and then the key takeaway here is we need the energy of this room and we need each other to keep at it for the next year because we have bus lanes to build, we have bike lanes to build, we have insufferable public meetings to sit through. <laughs> um, we need to go to the State House and ask for more funding. And so what I would say is um, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you for celebrating another 10 in 1 with us. And um, thank you to the board, to the staff, um, to all of our sponsors and donors and supporters. Um, and have a great year. And we will see you back in the fight in 2020. Have a good night. <laughs>